challenge with climate change is not necessarily that the climate is changing. The challenge with climate change is the rate at which it's changing. And that to see a change in this would dramatically alter the whole quality of that coastline. I wouldn't want to lose all the diversity of all the organisms that are in the intertidal. The thing that's so amazing and unique about this place is that it's got all of these intact ecosystems from the top of the mountains down to the coastal ecosystems. As these glaciers melt, they contribute large quantities of water to the oceans, which causes sea level rise. This is an interesting color morph of blood star Henrichia. Put you back in there, pal. The purple urchin here. This is an algae called dead man's fingers. It's relatively common in the upper mid intertidal. And that is a tide pool sculpin or a fluffy sculpin. This is the ochre sea star, probably one of the icons of the Northwest intertidal zone. Great thing about the intertidal is that you don't even have to go too far. You can just take a small space and the more you look, the more you see. There's just a lot of stuff packed in a small area. The nice thing about these pools is that these are, are permanent tide pools. When the tide is out, these things stay full of water. They're nature's own bathtubs. They warm up just like a bathtub during a hot day. The temperature in these pools will rise. So these are also susceptible to global warming. So those mussels have basically been dislodged from these mussel beds over here by wave action. And a mussel on the loose is basically a dead mussel, because what's going to happen is it's going to settle someplace, and these anemones will basically catch them, and they'll devour them. This type pool is a nice little mesocosm of the intertidal world. So these are giant green anemones, Anthoplura xanthogramica, and these can live 70, 80 years. They are predators and they have these tentacles and if you actually touch them, they feel sticky because they have these uh, cells called nematocysts, which have little harpoons in them. This area illustrates uh, some classic intertidal zonation. Typically, the upper zone of organisms is based on physiological tolerance, say to desiccation or to heat stress. And so this certainly is, is germane to global warming effects. The lower zone tends to be structured by predation. This sea star, Pisaster, is a voracious keystone predator, and they really set the lower elevation. The reason why there's this line right here is because these guys are running around eating these mussels. And because they can't effectively forage too much higher, it creates space for these mussels to thrive. With global climate change, we're expecting to see higher sea surface temperatures or higher sea levels. So we would expect these mussel beds to sort of march up in elevation a little bit. Of course, in some areas, like this flat area here, there's not a whole lot of elevation for them to go up. As sea level rises here, these sea stars that are their predators are going to be able to swamp this entire area. Uh, so global climate change, we're expecting to see some, uh, some very stark changes. I'm Bill Bacchus, I'm a physical scientist here at Olympic National Park. And today we're at Hurricane Ridge on uh, one of our snow courses that we survey during the winter. What we're up here looking at is the snowpack. And specifically we're looking at how deep and how much water is held within the snowpack. So this is called a federal sampler. It's used to measure snow depth and snow water equivalent. And it's the same sampler that was designed and has been used since the 30s. Here at Olympic National Park, we started uh, snow surveys in 1949. In the last 60 years, we've seen a marked decline in the snowpacks. 
I always get a kick out of the fact of just thinking that, you know, in these same sites, you know, in 1952, some ranger, you know, skied a little bit further because the road wasn't there at the time and took the same measurements, which is the, you know, same thing we're looking at today. It's always kind of interesting to see what the snow's like. Like, look at how compact the snow is. Yeah, yeah. And take your knife. Here. So the, the federal sampler has markings on the side that are marked in inches, and that gives us our, our snow depth at each of our stations along the snow course. And then when we weigh the snow core that we pull out from the snowpack, you automatically get the equivalent in inches of precipitation, so it's really neat. That is amazing. Yeah, it's neat that it's all calibrated that yeah. way. All right, so we've got 74. 74. A smaller snowpack is likely to have a major impact on downstream ecosystems. And a good example is salmon in the Northwest. If you have a smaller spring snowpack and it melts faster, then the amount of water in the streams in late spring and summer is going to be smaller. And it may be such that the salmon that would normally spawn that time of year don't have the proper conditions, the water temperature or the amounts of flow in order to access their spawning areas and use it. You know, you're affecting ecosystems from the top of the mountains to the ocean itself. Organisms in these ecosystems have adapted over the millennia, but I think what most scientists are worried about is that this is such a rapid change and there's so many other pressures on these species that they're gonna have difficulty surviving. Decreasing snowpacks lead to decreasing glaciers throughout the world, and this is a problem that we're seeing. And so it's all tied in. As these glaciers melt, they contribute large quantities of water to the oceans, which causes sea level rise. Basket is a very common type of basket called a burden basket, basically an old backpack. They would have been used with a tump line uh, that went across your head that was used for gathering clams or any other plant materials and moving it from one place to another. You see the fine weave. I'm Paul Gleason. I'm Chief of Cultural Resources here at Olympic National Park. The outer coasts are home to four tribes, the Bacaw, the Quileute, the Ho, and the Quinault. And we have approximately 19 sites that we've identified that they uh, used, archeological sites. Four of these are petroglyphs or rock carvings and the other are village sites. It was a very warm summer about 10 years ago. The snow fields melted and visitors found this basket and brought it to us. It was really amazing because when we radio carbon dated the basket, it turned out to be almost 3,000 years old. We don't know if we've found all the sites. In fact, we're pretty sure we haven't found all the sites. So with the additional chance for newly exposed sites, it's gonna be really helpful to have park visitors share their discoveries with us, just as the park visitor who discovered the basket at Instruction Point recognized the importance of it and brought it right in so that we could go out and recover it and make the most of a really great find. All of these sites are gonna be vulnerable if the coastline is affected by rising sea levels because these sites will begin to erode away. The other thing that would be a concern is that a number of these areas are traditional places that tribes have been gathering food and other materials for eons. And as we see rising sea levels, and if you see rising temperatures, the large shelves that support a large amount of intertidal environment may be gone and show the movement or change in the intertidal. So both of these could affect traditional cultural activities. I'm Hazel Levine. I'm a biological technician for the Olympic National Park. And one of my jobs is to download temperature data loggers in the Rocky Intertidal. 
We have what we call our chitin design here, which is an epoxy encasement that we then take the top off of. And uh, the, the temperature data logger is actually thoroughly embedded inside of it. And so the idea on this design <clears throat> is that basically we have uh, sort of a relatively hydrodynamic uh, sort of lip around it that we break apart. During the winter, you can get some, uh, some, some, some pretty awesome storms and, and the true sense of the word of awe. We have an array of uh, nine of these up and down the 70 mile coastline. And the nice thing about these is that we get not only submerged water temperature, which is a proxy for what organisms are experiencing with the ocean water, but we also get an exposed air temperature because organisms that are in the intertidal sort of live in both worlds. And so global climate change impacts hit them on both ends. Yeah, we're gonna put this right there and it's an infrared transfer. And so it transfers from these little ports right here, right through there. And then we press the button and hopefully we have some data. transferring right now. These temperature data loggers will record temperature every hour, and these run continuously year-round. We download them once a year, uh, so we get a very nice fine-scale record of any type of warming or cooling events. That's it. So now we capture the data, and the great thing is, is that this is now reset the data logger, so we can cover it back up. This sea epoxy can withstand the onslaught of the sea. If we didn't have epoxy, our lives would be a lot more difficult. <laughs> yeah, it would be, be a lot more difficult without epoxy. Marine organisms have their own epoxy, we have to buy it. <laughs> These critters are actually pretty good at being able to deal with what nature has thrown at them. The challenge with climate change is not necessarily that the climate is changing. The climate's been changing for millions of years. The challenge with climate change is the rate at which it's changing. So organisms can only respond at a certain rate to environmental change. If the environment changes too fast, then they can't keep pace with that. Global climate change is going to have severe impacts in the rocky intertidal such as this. However, some of these organisms will persist and survive, and they will adapt to it. There will still be life here. It'll just be a little bit different, or maybe a lot different than the way it is now.